It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight, introducing a special post-election edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Joining Larry LeSeur, our permanent editor, our CBS News correspondent, Robert Trout, and chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune, August Heckscher. Well, the elections are over, but because of their closeness and protracted nature, we decided to alter the format of our Conoscope program tonight, and instead of interviewing one distinguished guest, we thought we'd interview two of them, both noted political reporters, and to try to find out from them, if possible, just what really happened in those elections. I think I'll start by asking Bob Trout, what is the situation right now, Bob? Well, I'm not going to be able to tell you what really happened last night, Larry. I don't think anybody can, but I can tell you what the situation is. The uh, Democrats did, of course, get control of the House of Representatives, and they did it by 29 seats. The uh, present lineup for the next Congress is going to be the uh, Democrats 232, the Republicans 203. But, of course, the fascinating thing about it all is that the uh, Senate is still in doubt and it may be more than a month before we do know who's going to control the Senate. That's not certain. It hinges now on the two states on both sides of the country, New Jersey and Oregon. In New Jersey, the uh, Republican candidate Clifford Case is very narrowly ahead by about 800 votes, I think. Of course, there'll be an official recount. may take a month. And in Oregon, when I last looked at the tickers, the Democrat had suddenly gone to the lead, Mr. Newberger, leading the incumbent Republican Senator Guy Corden by about 710 votes. The state's almost in. Republicans have to take both these states. If they take both, there'll be a tie. Republicans 48, Democrats 48 with independent Senator Morse, and then, of course, Vice President Nixon will break the tie. In other words, they won't have to reorganize the Congress if it's a tie vote, the Senate? If it's a tie vote, the Republicans organize the Senate. The Vice President votes to break it to break the tie, but if the uh, Democrats win in Oregon tonight or whenever the recount comes, it's all over and the Democrats have the Senate too. Well, I'd like to find out uh, from uh, Augie, there seems to be a revolt, there seems to have been a revolt, Mr. Heckscher, against those who were in, but the electorate seemed to take it out on the governors rather than on the senators. How do you account for that? I would, I would suppose the answer to that is, Larry, I really hadn't thought of the question before, uh, that like everything else in, the ele in these elections, the causes seem to have been rather spotty and local. Uh, where there was a popular uh, senatorial candidate, for example, like Margaret Chase Smith in, in Maine, she was re-elected, but where the governor was unpopular, he was not re-elected. And I would say that in many places where the governors were not re-elected, you would find that there were local reasons for, for that happening. Well, uh, nevertheless, how does the possession of these, uh, the majority of the governorships actually affect the whole situation so far as the presidential elections are concerned in 1956? with the Democrats in the possession of the majority of the gubernatorial commands? Well, I think the effect is uh, really indirect. In the first place, uh, it affects the whole atmosphere of politics today. The Demo insofar as one party controls the governorship, it helps set the atmosphere and create the, uh, the general pattern of feeling for one party instead of another. For example, Governor Dewey here in New York was an early backer of President Eisenhower. Uh, he really worked out here in New York State many of the ideas and approaches which later were effective in Washington. And then, of course, when the presidential conventions come up, the man who is governor has a control over the delegation, which the man who does not have that gubernatorial seat, of course, can't pretend to. He doesn't have the patronage, he doesn't have the public power, and so on. So the man who is, in, for example, the, the governor of New York State, wields a tremendous uh, power when it comes to the convention of, of 1956. Well, Bob Trout, you've covered many a political convention, a presidential convention. Isn't it true that the governors of these states actually do control those delegations when they go to the conventions and the, the Democrats in control of the New York, New Jersey, and uh, Connecticut, it will uh, have a very powerful influence on the 1956 elections, and the nominations at any rate. On the nominations, mm -hmm. yes, the governors almost always do control them. Yes, indeed. Uh, because that may by itself create uh, greater rivalries, don't you think so, and greater difficulties within the convention. Each mm -hmm. governor becomes, so to speak, a favorite son with candidates if he wants backing mm -hmm. him. Well, August, do you think some new personalities have arisen out of these uh, elections, personalities which may have political aspirations in the future for higher rank, for the top 
names on a future ticket? Oh, yes, I would say definitely. That's the interesting part of any election. But here in New York State, uh, Congressman Jack Javits, it seems to me, has risen like a, like a star in the Republican firmament. And I don't know where he'll end up, but certainly a man who has that vote-getting power is going to be on another ticket another year. Well, how do you feel about uh, the uh, elevation of Harriman if he still holds this uh, gubernatorial lead? in the event of a recount. How do you feel this will affect his uh, presidential aspirations, Bob Trout? Well, I don't know about his aspirations. Uh, anybody who's done uh, what Mr. Harriman has done is naturally considered a candidate, Larry. Uh, for instance, in Ohio, too, like Governor Frank Lauschie, the Democratic governor who always wins in that Republican state, is considered to be a contender now in the uh, 1956 Democratic Convention. But Governor Lauschie has made the, oh, the customary statement. He said, uh, I don't want to make any speeches outside of Ohio until 56 is over. And last night, remember, Averill Harriman said, not too strongly maybe, but he said uh, his candidate is Adlai Stevenson. Incidentally, Mr. Truman said that today, too. Did you know that? Yes. Well, Bob, I'd like to ask you something about the, uh, the pollsters with whom you worked rather closely at election campaign headquarters. What happened to all the pollsters in this campaign and those Univac machines? Didn't they make some, uh, didn't they predict a big Democratic sweep? I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's the old question. I don't know. Yes, the machines uh, at one time uh, had a couple of results that didn't come out that way, but uh, I guess I just don't understand what makes that machine work in the first place, Larry. I don't understand the principle of it. Well, August, how would you account for the uh, tendency of the pollsters to predict a big Democratic sweep and uh, then find it falling apart towards the end? Well, I noticed that one newspaper here in New York which had conducted a poll claims uh, success today because they are only, only 2.5% off in the vote. Well, if you're 2.5% off, that can make a tremendous difference, particularly when the uh, results are as close as they have been in many contests. Well, August, in the view of the closeness of the, of the Senate race, do you think that this uh, minimizes the fears that there was of a Cold War between the President and the Congress? Oh, yes. I don't think that the expression Cold War was ever really descriptive, and I don't think President Eisenhower really felt it was descriptive of the situation that re would result. What? It will be a little more difficult for the President to confer with men other than his own parties. The possibility of investigations in the hands of the Democrats will be used against the Republicans. Well, I'd ask Bob about that. With the uh, Democrats in, in control of the House, Bob, do you think that the investigations will be the order of the day by the Democrats, and possibly that uh, the uh, Dixon Yates contracts will be brought up in the future by Democratic investigators? In one short but strong word, yes. Yes, Dixon Yates is going to be heard from a good deal. And of course, uh, there's still a very good chance if the Democrats win one of these two states, Oregon or New Jersey, the Democrats will have all the Senate committees too, including Senator McCarthy's committee, all the committees. It see, does seem ironic, doesn't it, that uh, Senator Case, if he should win after being denied support by uh, Senator McCarthy. If he should win, he will ensure that Senator McCarthy remains chairman of the Senate Investigations Committee. Well, what do you actually think happened to the influence of Senator McCarthy in this election, August Hicks? Well, uh, I would say that on the whole, uh, Senator McCarthy received very little comfort from these elections. He wasn't campaigning actively for the Republicans. The one Republican whom he said he opposed, Clifford Case, has either won or has come so close to winning that it's really a political miracle. And I just don't feel that he can take much comfort or satisfaction from what's happened. And Representative Kirsten lost, too, in, uh, in Wisconsin. Yes, that's true. And then there were, of course, ones, it's hard to say. As I said, these elections are spotty. What we would say was a right-wing Republican like Mr. Meek in Illinois lost. A right-wing Republican like Mr. Bender in Ohio won. Well, did you see any pattern to these elections, August Hexer, in, in a philosophical way? Did the liberal wing of the Republican Party do better than the right wing, would you say? No, I would, I would hesitate to make a broad generalization because I think in doing so we detract from what is the, the wonderful aspect of, a, of an election that has no pattern, that is full of individual, of individual paradoxes and strange occurrences that are hard to explain. Certainly the liberal Republicans here in the East did well. Herter and Salt and Stahl did well. Large, on the other hand, lost. Ives lost, but Case and Javits won. I'd say in the, in the West, you find the right wing dividing, one losing, one gaining. And look at Oregon. It's, uh, it's a liberal Democrat, Newberger, who is now just slightly ahead of the conservative Republican, Guy Corden. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob Trout, would you say that uh, unemployment played a role in this election? And I was thinking particularly of Michigan, but then when I look at Ohio, I find that uh, even Mr. Lauschie didn't pull Senator Burke in, although there's widespread unemployment in Ohio. But in Michigan, yeah. did you feel unemployment did count there against uh, 
the uh, incumbent senator? Well, that's part of the fascinating thing about all these elections, isn't it, Larry? You're never really sure just uh, why what happened did happen, but uh, everyone seems to think, maybe just because it's the easiest thing to say, that it was the unemployment in Michigan that knocked out Republican Senator Ferguson. He was a very important Republican, head of the policy committee, but uh, Michigan, Detroit, especially Wayne County, was supposed to be the center of the unemployment situation uh, in that area. And Senator Ferguson really went down, didn't he? To a political unknown, Pat McNamara. Yes, well, it still seems confused. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bob Trout and August Hexer. It appears from what we saw in the elections and what we heard tonight that only a few things are certain. One thing was certain, there was no public apathy. Actually, there were more people voting in this election than ever took part in a midterm election in the country's history. And one thing was proved, too, that the American voter remains completely unpredictable completely independent, and not even the most complicated machine or the most brilliant political analyst can chart the voters' behavior in advance, not here in this country. Voters seem to cross party lines, they cross union and business loyalties, and it seems that one kind of farmer votes differently from another kind of farmer. A dairy farmer doesn't vote the way a corn and hog farmer does, and a grain farmer votes differently. Well, it appears the country, it appears to me at least, is in some kind of unusual political balance. Aside from local issues, I think the most important things that occurred in this election was that people were voting in favor of peace, in favor of prosperity, and their own pocketbooks. Well, the, chi the cry of recount is still in the air tonight, and nobody can predict the results until all the votes are finally and officially counted. So I'd like to thank August Hexer and Bob Trout again for being here tonight, and to say good night to all of you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this special edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Robert Trout and August Texture, with Larry Lasseur, our permanent editor. How many of the things you own will be serving you 10 years from today? Probably not your present car, most surely not your present television set. Well, just think of this. That barring accident or abuse, the Longines watch which you buy and give this Christmas will be actually better than new at this time in 1964. And there is, of course, a reason for this. For almost a century, Longines has been acknowledged as just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. Of all the world's fine watches, only Longines watches have been honored with 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Yes, the Longines watch which you give this Christmas will be a treasured memento for years to come. Consulted daily with confidence. For greater accuracy, it's a traditional Longines quality. And every Longines watch is designed as a style leader. And yet, you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. And may we suggest that if you pay the price of a Longines, insist on getting a Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longine and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches.